Today, we are delighted to welcome Dennis Klaus, Professor Emeritus at Webster University in Missouri, who will give a lecture on continuing bonds in bereavement. Dennis Klass received his PhD in the psychology of religion from the University of Chicago and has been active in the study of death, dying and bereavement ever since. Especially well known for his pioneering research into continuing bonds in bereavement, Klass has published widely, including writing several books on parental grief and co-editing collections such as Continuing Bonds, New Understandings of Grief and Continuing Bonds in Bereavement, new directions in research and practice. This afternoon's lecture will run for approximately one hour with half an hour afterwards for questions. At the conclusion of the talk, my colleague Becky Miller will field the questions. Please note that Professor Class's talk will be recorded, but the recording will stop before question time. With that, I would like to warmly welcome Professor Class to speak to us. Oh, thank you. It's um, wonderful to be here. Um, Matthew and I were just talking for a few minutes. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be in York? Um, it's, one of, it's one of the favorite places in the UK. I have wonderful memories of the train museum and wandering around the Minster uh, and other places. Um, and then I, the, the, the memory that's, that's the strongest for me is I cannot remember which gate it was because there's a couple. There's what eight gates into through the wall uh, into the center city, um, but all of a sudden I stood there and I would just felt this incredible sense of familiarity. And a little while later, I realized that that was the model for a castle, that a play castle that I had. It must have been five or six years old because we left that house when I was six and a half years old. And I don't remember it at our at our next house. So it's nice to be in York, even 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 if it's this way. Um, let's start with full disclosure. Uh, I really screwed up uh, trying to. I got to get I got to get this out so I can. I need I need I need to get the, back to. Uh, there I go. I I I, re I really messed up. I use uh, PowerPoint all the time. I use Zoom for meetings. I couldn't combine the two. I thought I could, and then I couldn't. So what's happening now is my slides are being shown uh, from York, my uh, picture and my uh, video and, and, and what I'm, and my voice is coming from Washington, near Washington, DC. Um, and uh, every time I do this, they're gonna change the slides. So if I start to do this, that means that I'm making a really serious point, uh, but you know it, I'll just wave. So that's that, that's what you're getting. I'm sorry. Um, the first computer that came into our house uh, when our kid when my kids were uh, uh, eight and ten. Uh, therefore, I never learned a thing, um, and they always did it. When they went away to university, I would just call them up, and they would take care of me. So. To this day, when I, I I'm having a little trouble with my computer now, I will go over. And my grandson will 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 take care of it. Um, when I was a kid, people who were my age, we said that they were from the horse and buggy days. So was that an English expression, uh, British expression? Anyway, uh, it meant that they were before automobiles. I don't know what you call people like me now, so I'm sorry. Um, okay. Several, we're, we're talking about the continuing bonds model of grief. Several researchers developed the continuing bond models of grief at the, at the same time. Simon, do you all know Simon Rubin's two-track uh, model of bereavement? Okay, well, it's, it's good. Um, Phyllis Silverman, who was my co-editor on the continuing bonds book where we introduced the model, uh, studied, uh, began a widow to widow program, a peer a, a peer to peer program, and interviews with bereaved with bereaved children. So Phil, you know, Phyllis and I are the co are essentially the co creators of the model as it exists now. Um, Tony Walter, uh, I'm not sure where Tony is now. I think he's retired from Bath, uh, and I'm not sure where he is now. But he's still very active. Um, he and I have been corresponding for 30 years. Uh, and we've been together four times. So long as we were ever together is when Matthew was there uh, at uh, Copenhagen uh, a year or so ago. Um, he, and 
you can read all of those folks on your own. Uh, I'm going to um, just talk about my, I'm just going to talk about my contribution and how, and how it happened. Um, the, the turning the turning point in, in my career was when parents in a self-help group uh, asked me to be uh, an advisor as they formed a local ch a local chapter. Uh, you have compassionate friends in the UK. Are, are any of you familiar? I'm only seeing four or five of you. Have any if any of you any familiarity with that? It's it. What the important part from our point of view is that it is based on experiential knowledge. If you look at most of the concepts that we use, that the psychologists use in bereavement studies, they come from somewhere else. Freud's idea of decathexis came from his understanding of the male child's response to having to give up his mother uh, because his father was going to kill him. You all know about it. You all know about Oedipus, right? Uh, so it came from there. It didn't come from study of bereaved people. In that uh, in that article, in that article uh, or that essay, Freud never mentions bereavement. He gives no example. And when his own daughter um, died, um, he did not use that to describe his own grief. And when his and her daughter, when her son died, uh, his uh, grandson died, he did not use any of that. So and yet. And yet that kind of model that came from the Oedipus complex stuck with us for all these years. And I'll note in a couple of minutes, it's still with us. Um, John Bowlby's uh, model of grief, the attachment theory, that came from parents, from children separated from their parents, largely during the blitz. Because um, then, you know, that's what, he, that's what he was studying. Interestingly, he studied the children separated from their mothers or caregivers. He never studied the mothers separated from their children. Why is the child's experience more interesting than the adult's experience? Uh, but that's where that came from. Uh, the concept of trauma and grief came into psychological studies largely through the uh, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder, which got quickly into the uh, official list of diagnosis. Um, and that was not based on bereaved people. That was the new name we gave to a very old thing uh, called uh, combat fatigue uh, in the Second World War and shell shock in the First World War. So that, you know, it was, it was about soldiers in traumatic situations. It was not about bereaved people. The advantage I had with the self-help group is that the group itself did not use any um, concepts from uh, the social sciences or philosophy. They said it's they, it was based on their own experience, what uh, in the literature is called experiential knowledge. Um, some of you, uh, some of you might uh, know uh, Bruner on folk psychology. Is that an okay? I get it. I'm getting a couple of nods, but. Um, it's so it's a folk psychology. It's based on their own experience. I would uh, I was I was asked to be a professional advisor. By and large, it's hard for people to get into those groups because they're suspicious of outsiders. If you haven't, as they say, been there, then um, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I was able to be with them for tw for twenty for twenty years. Um, when I was trying to understand them, I just sat and I listened. It's ethnographic research, participant observation, grounded theory, whichever whichever you like to talk about. I've got a, I have a, I have a couple of essays on the on the method uh, that that I used. Um, I just sat and listened. And you asked a question. You say, "Can I explain the phenomena in front of me?" And the answer was using the um, the answer was using the the theories available to me at the time in the research, the answer was I could, I, it, I could only use the theories available to me by shoehorning the data in in a way that didn't work. I, this is a real hand wave. Oh, there's the bereaved parents. Do, go to the next slide. Um, but they ask philosophical questions. Uh, you want a really interesting question? You can ask philosophically. Where was God when my child when my child died? That that question that for bereaved parents and any people trying to understand them, that question reverberates through every thought you will ever have about what is the meaning of a child's death. Where was God when my child died? Um, it didn't mean they stopped believing in God. It means that God let them down. 
he was supposed to be there. I know that you're supposed to say she for God now, but that's not the way they did it. They were old fashioned. Um, what was I to what was I to make of a, of a meeting of just the fathers uh, one time and and he was talking about his child uh, in when she was in the hospital with cancer and at night kind of just before she had sleep she said Daddy, how does God decide who gets the miracles? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, parenthood provides the meaning of the, for daily living um, and. When that meaning is taken away, how do you live? How do you how do you live? Uh, when a, ch a child represents the future, uh, what will come after us? The parents used to say to each other, "When a parent dies, we lose our past. When a child dies, we lose we lose our." There I am. I found it. Uh, so, parents, let's talk about the parents in the self help group for a minute. Uh, keep the next slide. Um, They share their pain. They talk. They talk about being there. Uh, you guys can anal You guys can analyze that in terms of um, a design. Uh, I think Heidegger is mostly, if I understand him, which I don't uh, very well. Um, if I understand him, uh, he's largely about my own experience of my own mortality. Uh, how that applies to our experience of others, other mortal, other people's mortality. I'm not exactly sure, but their parents said only those who have been there can really understand. The group members have been there. It's about the relationship and we need to, and, and how I can be that one, my methodological problem was how I can be there as not having been there in the sense that, the, in the sense that they were. Uh, okay, now, um, parents, um, Parents share, share practical solutions to problems. I need to go, uh, oh, that's okay. I've skipped, we skipped the slide, but it's okay, I'll catch up. They share practical, there we go, practical solutions to problems, ways of being in the world. What do you say to somebody when they ask you, how many children do you have? It's an interesting question for them because it's context dependent. Uh, and they work out very elaborate ways of talking about that. Um, if it's somebody that I'm just in a commercial, like I'm trying to sell them something or, you know, uh, uh, to help them with their problem, help them with their computer problems at the, at the help desk, um, I just tell them how many living children, because the other is going to, if I tell them that I have a dead child, that's going to skew the relationship. But if, and, or I can say, well, I had four children. And if they pick up the head and ask, then I tell them. And if they back away, I put them into the we won't be close category. You see how that's going to work? What does it mean to have a child? They share and they validate their bonds, their bonds with their with their children. Okay, now I'll go to and they do that in some and they do that in some really interesting rituals. Every meeting begins with going around the circle. And if there's 40 people there, that goes around a lot. Um, every meeting begins with going around the circle and saying their name and their child's name, how their child died and how they're doing this week. At the end of 25 or 40 people saying that, it's a very, very, very quiet room. It, that, the, saying the name of the children puts it into a very sacred space. Um, if you want to be friends with a bereaved parent, Say to them, tell me about, tell me, tell me the name of your child and tell me about your child. Don't ever forget that. And always use the child's name when you talk about it and you can help them. You can be there with them. They share pictures. Um, the first time I think I really began to understand bereaved parenting was a night that uh, they brought in, everybody brought in a picture of their child and they just sat around and, you know, shared the pictures and people would talk about, you know, and I suppose now they wouldn't bring pictures. They'd all bring their phones, right? Um, but um, at the end of the meeting in those days, they used to ask me to say a few words. They weren't quite sure. They weren't quite sure of themselves. So Dr. Class uh, became kind of you know the, the validator, and I was I was no not yet, don't I just I was a scratch. Um, so they were they were sharing these pictures, and they sat around for ninety minutes, clearly enjoying themselves looking at, at, at pictures of each other's dead children and talking about it. And at the end of the meeting, they said, Dr. Class, what would you like to say? 
what are you supposed to say to that? I had no words could, that could explain that. And so I just said what I felt. I said, now we know there's a lot of beautiful children in heaven. And that's when they let me in because I could, because I got to know their kids after that. Okay, that's enough. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, there's a the, the highlight of the year is a holiday, holiday candlelight service. Um, the first one was uh, was pretty small, about a hundred people. Uh, later, it went got to about nine hundred people in a Jewish synagogue. Uh, two weeks, uh, three weeks before Christmas, that was kind of interesting. In which they did an early use of PowerPoint. They put a, a a picture of each kid on the screen as they say the name, and as the name is said, the parents stand up along with all the relatives they brought. This is a way to include the kids in the Chris in the in the winter holidays. They stand up and they light a candle. I remember the year that uh, a children's choir then sang uh, the Rainbow Connections, you know, the Muppet song. Uh, okay. Uh, they, go on, they go on a cemetery tour. Uh, one, of the, one of the groups uh, organizes a cemetery. You know, standing by a child's grave is a really lonely, lonely. Whew. It's hard for me to still think about that. So, they all take so they they rent a van they go to they they all get in they go to each of the child's graves and you know around the city that takes that takes a little while and at the grave they get acquainted with the they get acquainted with the child there and the parent will make a little presentation you know they're sometimes quite elaborate they'll bring what in those days was a handheld tape recorder and play the child's favorite songs or sometimes play a recording of the, that they have made of the child it's still sad but it's not lonely, and that's what the that's what the self help group group does. Okay, next, and then they do a at the at the at the national meetings and at the um, uh, picnic annual picnic. They do a butter a balloon release. You know, you tie a note to the balloon and you send it up into the sky. I don't know where balloon messages go, uh, but when they go there together, it feels stronger than when you send one balloon into into the sky. Okay. Oh, there's my hand. Um, so grief is, a, grief is a shared experience. Keep going. Um, my child becomes our children have died. Um, the shared bonds with the children become bonds between group members. Next slide, please. Um, um, there was a there's there's I can't find my hand oh there it is there's a group there's a song that one of one of the couples who was on the uh, national board were both music teachers and they wrote a song and the song is um, our children live on in the love that we share now that's a very hard line to get to do a, a hermeneutic to but the parents understood immediately the bonds among the group were bonds were also also in, also included their children and so they did things like uh, on the anniversary of the children's death or the children's birthday would they would send cards to each other uh, if some of you have any uh, friends or uh, uh, friends of your parents who uh, who've had a child died see what happens if on the child's if the anniversary of the child's death you send a card and just say I'm thinking of you you don't have to say you don't have to say any, you don't have to say they also shared uh, they they also they also shared uh, solutions to they also shared solutions to problem. We already talked about how many children you die. Um, none of that could be explained by the by the theories of grief that were available to me at the time. The one that was really available was Freud. Show the slide that has a picture of Freud on it. The grief work hypothesis. Uh, uh, each single one of the memories and situations of expectancy which demonstrate the libido's attachment to the lost object is what is met with the verdict that the reality, the verdict of reality that the object no longer exists. That's Freud. Well, first of all, the parents did not think their children were, ob were objects. So th that, that didn't speak to them. And furthermore, death does not mean that their child did not exist. Death ends a life. It does not end a relationship. Um, a popular, a popular version, uh, find the Kubler-Ross slide. Uh, the popular version was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Uh, I, I got into this thing, uh, in 1969, 
when I was an assistant in the famous seminar, the, her book on death and dying that started this whole thing came out for the Christmas sales um, the year I was working with her. Uh, so, you know, the next year she was a, she was an international celebrity, um, but that was after I, after I had stopped uh, working. And so you've got this, you know, this, uh, here's the, all of the happy faces uh, or happy and sad faces and except then suddenly it's, it's happy as if, oh, the death is okay. No, it's not. A child's death, death is never okay. And living in a world where children die is not okay. Um, I remember trying, I remember the first night that the uh, bereaved parents met, I sat there trying to say, let me see, is this anger? Is this denial? Is this a bargaining? And I remember driving home that night and saying, well, that didn't work. Um, okay, let's go on. Um, so if, uh, where am I? What, 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 for example, was was I supposed to make of a, of a, of a poem uh, that a mother wrote for the newsletter? Uh, my eyes strain to search my heart for distant memories, but your face fades as I reach out to you. All that remains are warm feelings and smiles, tears and glimpses of your love in the wake of your parting. Uh, if you can't make this earthly journey with, through time with me, will you then come along in my heart and wish me well? Try to do that one with Freud. Try to do that one with Bowlby. Try to do that with as, as grief, grief as trauma. We needed, we needed, a, we needed a new, new theory. Um, well, if Western psychology, if Western uh, theories of grief didn't work, um, what did? And the answer turned out to be Japanese ancestor rituals. All right. Um, keep going, keep going, keep going. One more. This, uh, this is my introduction to Japanese ancestor rituals. Uh, the, the person in, on the left, that's my wife. Uh, the woman in the far back is the waitress uh, at a really nice uh, resort that we went for a weekend. Um, and the, the woman is Sachiko and the, ma and the man is uh, Yushin. Those are the gooses. They are both Buddhist priests. Uh, Sachiko became a Buddhist priest after, uh, her, after their son died. Um, her son was alive when my, when my son lived with them as a high school student for a summer exchange program. So my understanding, you know, my uh, introduction to Buddhism, give me a, another slide, they're Buddhist priests. You see the, the, the young woman on the right, uh, she's, uh, that's uh, Yumiko. Uh, she, her high school graduation present was to come and live at our house in the United States for a year. Uh, she is now the married, she's got two kids, one has a developmental disorder of some kind. Um, and she is now the head priest at the temple in, in, in that form of Buddhism. Okay, one more. In that form of Buddhism, um, uh, temples, uh, temples are hereditary since 1868. This is a group of women who do. Um, this is a women, group of women who do a special kind of chanting. They meet um, in the Canaan Pavilion of the of the temple, uh, and they're wonderful people. And they are at the end of the meeting, uh, doing what you do at everything on Japanese gathered. They're having green tea, the, the hot water thing there, and it's a it's a wonderful custom. Um, next slide. Uh, ancestor rituals are a uh, an elaborate set of rituals supported, ancestor worship is an elaborate set of rituals supported by sophisticated theory in which those who are living maintain personal emotional bonds to those who have died for 33 to 50 years, depending on the sect of Buddhism. Effectively, you do ancestor rituals in, in a kind of a sequence that are different as the years go by, uh, but as long as anybody personally remembers them, the ancestor rituals are said for them, and then it becomes a and then it becomes a different thing. Ancestor, the picture of the people in black. Um, ancestor rituals begin with the reality of death. What you're seeing in front of you is a family gathered around the cremated remains of the person who has died. He was living a few days ago. Virtually all Japanese are cremated. There are hardly any body burials there. They bring the tray out. You can see that the form of the person is still on in the tray. And so there they are looking at the form of the, you know, it's, a, it's in a human form. The bones have just 
drawn when the flush was when the flush was burned away. And with chopsticks, they pick up the uh, pieces of the the pieces of the cremated remains and they put them in a um, in, in a uh, in an urn. Um, notice the woman on the right, far right, is tenderly holding the woman who has the chopsticks in her hand. Probably a daughter supporting her mother while they're going through. By the time they, they by the time it's over, all of the bones will have been picked up. Everyone will have participated in, in the ritual. There is no way that you can say that ancestor rituals or maintaining the continuing bonds in Japan is a denial of that when that's the way you start. In the United States, uh, we, we, we don't look at dead bodies. We uh, embalm them and paint them up and, and you say, doesn't she look good? And the answer is, give me the next slide. And the answer is, no, she doesn't look good, she's dead. Um, but we have a denial of death in the beginning of our, of, of our death rituals. This is how the Japanese started. And it takes a long time. Look at those are little pieces and they're picked up one by one with chopsticks. This takes a long time. Everybody, everybody participates. Okay, let's go to the Butsudan, the next one. Uh, this is a Butsudan that's in, uh, uh, it's in the major household of every large family. The, the Japanese family is changing like everything. Like, like everywhere else, but this is a traditional Butsudan. It's a Buddha altar in the house. Um, take a look at it. What you'll see is uh, the most, this is obviously for a holiday because they have the lantern song. Um, do you see the picture on the, on the shelf? Do you see the picture of the man? And then behind the flowers, there's another picture. That's what the Butsudan is there for, is to remember those people. Um, there are those a uh, red, they look like cake plates, but they're not. They're for altars. Uh, and you see the rice bowls there. Every morning, uh, every morning, uh, food is put out for the ancestors. Um, and then the brass bowl in the middle is full of sand. It's for holding incense. The, bra the brass bowl on the, on the right, on the red uh, pillow, is a bell. There's the, uh, the little, there's a thing for hitting, a, 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 a mallet for hitting the, the bell. Uh, and um, the little tiny bell in, in, in the right in the right hand corner, those are sold in temples all over Japan. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, go, apparently going to the uh, temple had something to do that was important enough that they put that bell on the. Um, uh, here's a different go to the next one. This is a different butsudan. You can see it's arranged differently, but it's got the elements. It's got it. It, it has the. Um, it has the picture down below. Uh, it has the bell. It has uh, other other stuff. Um, next one. So at the core, ancestor ritual is an expression of a human community that cannot be separated by death. Next. This is a priest at the uh, at, at the at the funeral. Uh, what's he doing? He's in front of the butsudan. Um, and uh, he is installing the person in the boots of them. The person used to be in their body. Where are they now? There are a lot of places, but his job here is to install. So when you do the rituals in front of the boots of them, you are in the presence of the dead person. That, by the way, is a very recent, uh, recent um, picture. Um, one of my neighbor's son is a filmmaker in Japan, and he took this to the funeral of a, of a friend of his. Uh, next, the living and the dead inhabit the same um, the, the same uh, uh, space, social space, uh, 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 even if their interactions are only in uh, uh, certain times and and ritual and ritual and ritual occasions. Um, uh, ancestor rituals next. And ancestor rituals seem very much to me like what I observed in the bereaved parents. Next. Um, bon, if you uh, if you put the honorific on it, it's Oban, um, is a summer festival in which the dead come back for three days. Uh, this is a picture of a family of 16 people. Uh, eight of them are living and eight of them are dead. Each lantern represents someone for whom ancestor rituals are done. Um, I don't know if it, you can see that uh, closely, but the, the small person uh, on the far left uh, among the living people. She appears to me to have Down syndrome. Can you see the short arms and the, the face? 
so that you know this is a family like any other family there are i think three generations of living people and i don't know how many generations of um, of dead people in that picture uh next um each when the when the lanterns are lit, each lantern guides a spirit back home for the three days. Uh, care, next, caring for ancestors is not is not simply an individual responsibility, but it's also a wider collectivity. Next, the holiday um, here, you know, this is just you know one side. The this would be this is just one slice of the place of the temple grounds where the end. The, where there's a cemetery where the ancestors or rituals are being done. So the community does it together. You're not alone in your grief in the traditional Japan. You're part of a community that is doing the same thing with you. You don't feel like you stand out like a sore thumb. You feel part of things. Uh, next, um, the, fun the first candlelight service I attended um, after I got prepped in Japan, I thought, you know, the children really have come back to see their parents for a few for a few minutes tonight. Uh, at the end of at the end of the uh, at the end of the the uh, service uh, at the end of bond, uh, the uh, spirits are put in uh, in lanterns uh, and on uh, little boats and put on into the stream. And when the next one, when the uh, when the flame goes out. The spirit is returned to the other side, but they'll be back next year. I can still talk to them at the Butsudan. I can still talk to them other places. They still come in. They still come in my dreams. They are an active part of my of my world. Next, uh, we can talk about family graves. Um, the flat stone there in the middle um, is uh, when you take that when you take that off. Um, there's a big opening and all of the urns uh, from the, uh, that we saw them filling up with the chopsticks, they're all in there together. Um, you're, not buried in a, you're not buried in an individual grave. In the back, you see uh, an incense burner um, and uh, there's some other stuff on there. Uh, remember, the, remember the board that was next to the priest? They're there in the back of the grave. They're there in the back of the grave, and on that board, the priest has the pre the, 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 when we stayed in with at the temple, uh, Yushin spent uh, hours writing calligraphy on these boards. It has a, a sutra, some of the Buddhist scriptures. It has the name of the person when they're living. It has the name of the person when they're dead. They get a special name when they're dead because they're on their way to Buddhahood. Uh, and at the, and the top is shaped like a stupa. A stupa in Buddhism is a place where you keep a relic of the Buddha. In other words, that, this is, that, that, that Buddhism is based on remembering the Buddha and just as Christianity is based on remembering Jesus. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, 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 it, is, it is of a piece. Um, next. Uh, so what do you do? What do you do? What do you do when you're there? You pour water on the grave to cool the spirits. You burn incense. You leave an offering, usually food that somebody that they liked. We saw lots of cans of beer when we wand wandered through the graveyard. But carrot juice, other stuff, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about giving a present. Next. A new development uh, since the 1960s is uh, in ancestor rituals is misuku kuyu. Misuku, <coughs> misuku means a child of the water. It's um, a, a stillborn or aborted or a child born, uh, a child who dies as a, as a neonate. Um, kuyu is a ritual from the dead. Each statue represents one fetus or very young child. Uh, the parents care for the child as best they can. Can you see how they've got the toys on them and they wrap them in shawls and they give them hats? I love the Mickey Mouse. Um, and then Jizo, uh, the Bodhisattva at the crossroads, the Bodhisattva that can go between the levels of suffering, cares for them in a way that they cannot. The children are not abandoned. Uh, there's no, and notice again that they're here it's not like standing by the by the child's grave is a lonely experience. When you come here, you are in the presence of a lot of other misukukuyu. There'll be other parents there when you go. Uh, next slide. Um, the statues come in a variety of styles, and there are some specialized statues that have that have thousands thousands of these things. Um, 
The statue itself has a, it has the face of a child, but the long ears indicate that it's and and the way it's standing indicate that it's also a Buddha. So that it's a Buddha and a baby all at the same time. Um, next slide. Um, she's visiting a sibling who died, but is still a member of the family. She's using Piaget's sensory motor knowing. Do they teach Piaget at all in, in philosophy these days? It's French structuralism on cognitive development. I find it very useful. I'll, I'll come back to it in a bit. Uh, I find it very useful because some people still have sensory motor not knowing, you know, it's like, you know, a kid, a kid, a kid when it really wants to get acquainted with something, when he's really small, you know what he does, he puts it in his mouth. Um, and that's the way they know. Uh, and that develops Piaget says all the way up to from concrete operations, to formal operations to some kinds of ways of thinking which are even more abstract than that. Um, Learning the Japanese rituals helped me to make sense of what I was seeing uh, with the bereaved parents. Next, um, other, almost all, uh, many other cultures have festivals in which the dead come back. This is Day of the Dead in Mexico, uh, which is a combination of uh, Mayan tradition, Mayan and uh, uh, Christian traditions. It uh, it is it is what it it, it is what uh, All Saints Day was in um, in Europe when the Spanish went and conquered there. Um, Next, uh, here's the rituals at the, here's the uh, vigil at the grave. That's uh, an all night ritual with food and all of that sort of thing. Uh, next, every, uh, all expressions and symbols of dying and grieving are used symbolically in the culture. Here's uh, some symbols, the masks from the, and the skull mask from the Day of the Dead, which were used uh, in 1997 by sex workers to honor the people who had died from the AIDS epidemic. Next. Uh, all right, Edith, Stefan, and I, you met Edith last week, I think, um, edited an anthology uh, in, on the development of the continuing bonds after 20 years. I think she did some of this, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll rush through. Uh, here are the theme next. Uh, here are the themes that we found. Um, theme one, continuing bonds are not individual. They are intersubjective. Intersubjective means a reality that is held by one or more conscious minds. Uh, go to a football game uh, and you, you're, you, what you call football is different than what we call football, but the intersubjectivity inter of the fans uh, are the same in both places. They are all experiencing the same thing. They are knowing together. Uh, next slide, it's intersubjective between the the living person and the dead person. Um, it's inter, it's 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 inter, it's intersubjective uh, among the survivors. Uh, this is uh, at the AIDS epidemic during the AIDS epidemic of two gay guys at a funeral. Uh, at a funeral, um, just a personal story. Um, my wife, we spent the first ten years of our retirement before we moved down here. We spent it. Um, at the end of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, which is a large center of gay culture. We were the first, uh, we were the only uh, gay couple uh, when we joined the Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm sorry, we're, we're straight. I, I get confused about that sometimes. Uh, we were the only straight couple when we joined. Um, there were, were four couples when we left, so we thought we'd form a caucus. Um, the AIDS epidemic changed the gay community. It was no longer centered in the bathhouse. Suddenly, all that death and all of that um, suffering, they formed themselves into support groups. They became a different kind of community. One of the things that we did almost every month when we lived there is we made dessert for, you know, we would cook a couple of batches of cookies or brownies or something for the, for the AIDS support group that met once a month. These were people who 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 supported people with, with AIDS, so that you know it's it, the continuing bonds is intersubjective in the in the social network. Next, um, this is the Qingming Festival um, in in China. It's kind of like Oban. It's more elaborate, but um, we don't have time to talk about that. You can look it up on on uh, Google if you want. Um, 
Theme two, next. Uh, continuing bonds are central in the construction of meaning. Uh, next, we know that meaning making is not an individual activity. It happens in social relationship. Most people, if you ask them, but what does death mean? Many of them will begin, well I'm, an, well, I'm an Anglican and this is what we think, or I'm a Buddhist and this is what we think. In other words, we believe what, um, we believe by in, we believe that believing is part of our is part of our belonging. Um, it is talk, and, it, and so how do we do it next? Uh, meaning making takes place in interpersonal relationships. Next, oh, I'm sorry, you're on the one I want to be on. Um, just stay there. I'll I'll catch up. Uh, a bond's meaning then is an interaction between interior, interpersonal, communal, and cultural narratives by which individuals and community constructs meaning. Go to the one with the photograph. Um, bonds and meanings can be very complex and ambivalent. Um, uh, this is a, a statue uh, by uh, Augustus St. Gaudens, who is a major American, was a major American artist. It was commission, uh, commissioned by Henry Adams, um, who was a, an American literary guy. He was also the uh, grandson of the second president of the United States as a memorial to his wife, Marion Hopper Adams. She was called Clover by almost everyone who knew her. She committed suicide at the age of 42, swallowing chemicals she used in developing photographs. She was depressed. So have some of you had a friend or a relative with chronic depression? Look at this. This is not a person. This is not a person grieving. This is the person that's being grieved for. They're kind of there and they're not there. They're, it's a it's 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 an it's it's a difficult way to thing to describe. We can love them and yet we can never really know them because it's hard for us to get into the depression with them. That's what I was finding in in Emily's paper when I was reading it this morning. Um, when you when it, it's in Rock Creek Cemetery in Washington D.C., you can't stand away from it. You go through. It is surrounded by a big privet hedge. It's a very small area. There's a bench for you to sit on. St. Gaudens designed it so that you would have to look at her. I spent a half an hour there and continued to be blown away by it. Next one, scene three. Uh, continuing bonds raises questions in the truth or reality status of our interaction with that. Um, I don't need to tell you about this. Math Matthew is, is leading the way in the philosophical stuff there. But the group over at Alberg, you know, um, the group over at Alberg is also doing stuff. That's what philosophy is, uh, is, in, is equipped to do, is to talk about what's truth. What's the ontological reality of these experiences? We make decisions about our life based on our experience with the dead, and yet we in the West do not have a good ontology of that's what Edith, uh, I think Edith said that as part of her presentation. The problem with the experience of presence that Edith, that Edith investigated um, is that the uh, it was that we don't have a way of talking about that except parapsychology, which is simply trading one false certainty for another. We need to do a better job with that. Um, we live in an age that privileges objective scientific knowledge, the logical positivism. I shouldn't have to explain that to this group. Uh, the history of 19th century, keep going, one more. Uh, the history, one more. Uh, the history of 19th century spiritualism shows that uh, scientific proof is a dead end. Uh, the spiritualists thought that uh, they, had two, they had two arguments. First of all, they thought that in communion with the dead spirits, they could bypass religious institutions and get in touch with the supernatural naturally. And the other thing they thought is that they could be scientific. They said that their um, being in contact with the dead in seances were like the recently invented telegram, you know, that you can, it, it transcends space and time, it transcends space. Um, and so they said it was scientific. Uh, one more. It ended in, um, keep going. Uh, it, 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 it ended in, in charlatism, charlatans uh, stage shows. So the philosophical term about what is on, what is, uh, what the question is, the question of ontology. 
I'm not really, keep going. I'm not really qualified to answer the question, but I'll give you some ways I think we can start to think. I believe this. We don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. Next. Um, the distinction between knowing and knowing about, we don't have that distinction in English. In German, you know, you can wissen for knowing about and Ken and Gellert for I know you. Um, we had a, some friends who had been married for 65 years. Uh, Naomi died and um, Jerry uh, moved up to be near his daughter. Uh, I called him one day and I said, how you doing? He says, well, you know, I talk to her all the time. Um, and I said, oh, really? Do you hear her voice? He says, nah, I just know what she would say. And then he gave me a couple of examples and you know, he was right. And when, I, when he gave me the examples and I said, you're right, I had a very brief sense of Naomi's presence. The sense of presence is not at all unusual. Um, uh, let me see, where am I? I'm on the one that says Japan, uh, let's, let's keep going. I'm, run, I'm, running a little, I'm running a little behind. Uh, are, are, some of you for, uh, are some of you familiar with Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence? When I went to, uh, when I was a psychology major, we thought there was a thing called intelligence and that you could measure it. There's a very good book on that uh, by Stephen Jay Gould uh, called The Measure of Man in which he ends up talking about uh, his uh, retarded son. Um, but um, we thought there was this thing called intelligence. And you know what, you, you, you know, if you, you know, the IQ test, you know what IQ tests are good at predicting? They're good, very good at predicting how you, you will do on IQ tests. They don't predict anything else. There's no such thing as grand mal intelligence. Um, um, Gardner's, Gar Gardner has uh, multiple uh, music, visual, spatial, verbal, linguistic, logical, mathematical, body, kinesthetic, interpersonal, naturalistic. There are lots of kinds of intelligences and we need to use them all as we try to understand next. Theme four, continuing bonds are best understood within their cultural settings. It's, that's especially important as we develop a model of grief uh, that includes that that can be used cross culturally. The Western model of grief cannot be used cross culturally. If you use the concept of grief as presently defined by the psychologist, you and try to use that to understand other cultures, you will make major major misunderstandings. You can't do it. Um, it's the Western theory. Uh, go to the one with the picture. Cultural narratives can be cast at any level of abstractions. We're back to P Piaget. Uh, this is the, the uh, continuing bonds. Uh, this is heaven in the precious moments uh, memorial in Crothersville, Missouri. Do you have, um, they sell them in gift shops, precious moments, statuettes. It's an entire theory. It's an entire uh, a series of collective, you know, little statues about this tall. Uh, they're gray and white. Uh, and they are all dedicated to the emotion of, oh, ain't that cute. Um, and this guy, you know, who's made a lot of money selling these statues, uh, did a whole chapel. Uh, uh, this is heaven. You see that? You see the Golden Gate there, um, and the sign on the Golden Gate says "No more crying here." And next to the Golden Gate are a set of crutches, child's crutches, that he put in there because he knew a little girl who had been crippled and she died. That's. That is concrete operations. Uh, it is, you know, on the other hand, you can get very abstract. Let me give you the most abstract one that I think you may be interested in. Uh, you know that Shakespeare sonnet that begins, uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Uh, go down in, that's about continuing bonds. And every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course and trim. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor shall death brag thou under so many in his shade, when in eternal lines to time there grows. The eternal lines are Shakespeare's understanding of his poetry. So long as men shall live and eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Or in another, in a, in another, uh, in another sonnet, not marble nor, nor gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this show, this powerful rhyme, but you shall shine more bright in these contents and unswept stone be smeared by sluttish time. 
that guy could really write, couldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Un unswept stone be smeared by sluttish time. Um, cultures create the many ways we maintain continuing bonds. Next one. Uh, one of the first, re one of the, keep going. Um, one of the first uh, uses of photography was in continuing bonds with photographing dead. This young couple, is, uh, that, that child is dead. And the young couple is, sit is sitting there. That's the only family portrait they will have, but they will keep that. Now, um, the new now now uh, continuing bonds are being maintained by the new technology of uh, social media. There's a large uh, there's a large literature on social media, and that uh, it's just that every new technology uh, is um, every new technology has is about connect. It has elements of it about connecting to that. I'm not, I've lost his name now, but uh, the guy who was Marconi's, you know, the guy who invented radio, um, the uh, Marconi's uh, uh, major uh, competitor for inventing the radio um, was quite convinced that, that by this new technology, he was able to talk to the dead like they thought the dead talked through telegraph when the, in the spiritualists. Um, and so he got lost over there and Marconi becomes the inventor of the radio. It shows you continuing bonds can be harmful. Um, uh, go to the big, the, the uh, next one. You know the phrase, you know, they're together in heaven. <laughs> don't you like that? I don't know where this is. I found it on the internet. But when we look at this, we say there's a relationship that endures beyond death and our feeling about that is that we feel that then about our, we understand this because we feel, if you're lucky, in a relationship that transcends death. Next one. Continuing bonds are part of the larger, larger culture. This woman is at, is at the New York Trade Center Memorial, you know, when the planes hit the building in New York City in 9-11. Um, she's at the memorial. She comes to this collective memorial to express her deep personal grief. Next. Now, sometimes we reject meanings uh, with bonds. The United States is currently going through a very interesting time. The Confederates to the, you know, we had a civil war in the 1800s, Abraham Lincoln, Robert E. Lee. You might've read about that. It was, uh, it's made, it's in some books. Um, the monuments to the civil war dead were not put up after the, right after the civil war. They were put as Jim, they were put up as Jim Crow laws. Uh, we're being erect, you know, you know what I mean when I say Jim Crow laws, you know, you read about, we've got real problems in our country because they're, re they're reintroducing Jim Crow laws. And at the same time, the, the uh, conservatives, the uh, white nationalists are reintroducing Jim Crow laws. They are also resisting tearing down the monuments to the Confederate dead. Robert E. Lee wasn't a hero, he was a traitor. And so suddenly we are reevaluating in the United States the meaning of those monuments. If I leave Washington, D.C. to drive to Richmond, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia was the uh, capital of the Confederacy. I drive on a highway that only got renamed a few months ago, and the highway is called the Jefferson Davis Highway. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Con Confederacy. So sometimes we have to change the uh, the the, the uh, uh, the continuing bonds that we as a culture have. And sometimes when they're problematic, we need to change the continuing bonds we have personally with those who were important to us. Next one. Uh, this, is a new, this is a new memorial. It is the lynching, lynching memorial um, in, uh, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, in which suddenly we're saying we need to remember this part in the United States, we remember this part of our history. But of course, we learned how to do slavery from England. You know, if you uh, take a look at the British um, Victorian period and all of that uh, industrial expansion that was <coughs> that was done with cotton and cut with the start starting with cotton, uh, which was by slavery. Go to the next one. Uh, this is the Vietnam Memorial. Um, that really unified our my country uh, suddenly. Here were all the names of the guys who didn't get to march in parades when they came home from a stupid war that McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, admit, admitted later that, um, that he knew they couldn't win. Continu next one, continuing bonds may also help us to understand 
these people with whom we share 95% of our DNA. Her name is Dorothy, was Dorothy. She's a 33 year old chimp uh, who died of heart failure <clears throat> in Cameroon. Um, those chimps are in a in a um, in a in a, uh, uh, a sanctuary. That means that they were traumatized, often kidnapped as children after their mothers had been killed, and sometimes cut up for bush for a bush meat uh, after they have died. Uh, they have a culture too. Uh, are any familiar with Franz De Waal? Wonderful stuff. Uh, he is a primatologist. Uh, and his, his thesis is that we can understand ourselves better if we understand chim chimpanzees and gorillas better. They share 98 some point something percent of our, of our DNA. They're more like us than we are. Uh, than, um, than, than, and the only th difference is we have a developed verbal language. They have developed language, other kinds of languages. It's, uh, I, think it's the most, I think it's an incredibly interesting development in uh, psychology and certainly in understanding human cognition. Uh, the book you might want to start with is The Age of Empathy, in which he talks about empathy among the chimps and its limitations, how it's used, how it functions in society. And the one that I really like is called The Bonobo and the Atheist, in which he says that we can understand religions not as something from the top that comes from God. Religions are a natural part of the chimpanzee and, uh, and human um, uh, psyche because it just, it grows out of the way we interact with each other. Well, how shall I conclude this? I'm almost, I was, they said I spoke for an hour and I just about made it. The study, next one, uh, the study of continuing bonds uh, opens us up uh, to a wide range of phenomena and in, in bereavement including cultural phenomenon. And the last side, slide. And it opens us up to the complexities of our relationship with others, both with our relationship with the living and our relationship with the dead. Sorry, that's the best I could do in an hour. <laughs>